Hey everybody, welcome to episode 3 of the Roaming Viking Podcast. Before we begin, I just want to apologize for the sound quality, at least on my end. This is my first time doing a Skype-style podcast, and it kind of sounds like I'm drunk. That's only because there's a .25 second uh, delay on my end, so it, can, it, it it's a little weird for me. And I actually ended the podcast a little bit early when we could have went into more topics because it was starting to give me a little bit of headache. All right, with that out of the way, on today's podcast, we have my buddy Zach. We talked about a lot of different things, about North Korea testing their damn bomb, uh, a lot about Trump, the Arizona Hyperloop, which was absolutely amazing part, and a few other things, which I can't remember off the top of my head because my mind is fried after doing that podcast. All right, well, let's hear what he has to say. All right, uh, welcome to the podcast, Zach. Hi, how you doing? All right, so it's the end of the world. North Korea just um, uh, tested a one megaton bomb. What do you think about that? North Korea tested the bomb? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's mildly worrying. Honestly, I'm not that intimidated by North Korea, at least not as a threat directly to us. Um, I'm more concerned about the kind of threat that it would pose to our allies in the Pacific. Yeah, I agree, but I'm actually concerned about what Trump might do, because he's a little unstable. Uh, he's an idiot, to be sure, but for some reason, I don't expect him to go out of his way to cause a nuclear holocaust. I hope not, because uh, South Korea is one of our closest allies, same with Japan. I don't want to see either of them get uh, destroyed, because they make some of my favorite products. <laughs> Well, I'd be. Didn't didn't Japan say a few months back that they were planning on actually building some military power? I mean, I know according to the constitution, technically they're not allowed to do that, but I'm pretty sure we should lift those sanctions by now. Uh, no, they're allowed to build a uh, self defense power. Um, right. I'm not too right. sure about um, uh, um, actual offensive power. Well. I'm thinking that we as a country should probably lift the sanctions preventing them from doing that if we haven't already. I completely agree. Um, because, uh, <laughs> because if it gets any uglier, they're gonna we're going to want a buffer between us and North Korea and, and uh, Japan and South Korea still like us. Yeah, especially since we have a large amount of military bases there already. Hmm. I wouldn't put that as the reason why they like us, but yeah, sure. It's like a self-defense type deal. I don't know. Yeah. Oh, damn. But still, the entire situation is kind of fucked up. Yeah, I guess. North Korea's been threatening nuclear violence for decades now, and they still haven't done anything. Yeah, they're crazy, but they're also not that bright. Kind of reminds me of our credit. Our president in that way. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't think they're stupid enough to um, uh, actual launch an attack against us or our allies, but with the situation right now, I just don't know. Well, if they keep trying to talk a big game, eventually China's going to uh, have to put them back in their place, stick them in a corner. Yeah, I mean, they are like China's child, so... I, I would say China would tell them to sit in the corner because the adults are talking, but then I am reminded of our own leadership. Not really a good analogy. Yeah, that's not really a good analogy, but it's pretty close. <laughs> oh. And while I, can't, while I can't speak for the people in North Korea, I would like to think that the leadership that the leadership there at least has enough of a sense of self preservation so as not to do anything too stupid. Yeah, I, I don't think Kim Jong Un does, but I think his generals do. Well, that's the problem. They answer to him because otherwise they get killed off. <laughs> True. Who knows? They might do a coup just so they don't die. Well, that'd be the smart thing. I mean, that's the, that's sort of the reason why uh, I was kind of worried about whether or not Clinton might ma take office, because you know about that uh, that no-fly zone over Syria she was talking about. Yeah, I agree. Clinton. She, she'd she been pushing for that since long before uh, her being in the presidency was even an option. 
Yeah, so, I know. I highly doubt she would have she would have uh, gone down from that ledge, even though her own party was telling her how much of a bad idea it was. Because uh, a, a Cuban Missile Crisis style incident with Putin in power, the last the last of the old guard of the KGB, I sincerely do not believe he would have backed down. Un- unlo- unlike North Korea, I don't think he has that sense of self preservation. And who knows, North Korea might not either. I mean, it's scary either way. Yeah, true. I mean, I think Clinton probably would have made the situation worse. But at the same time, Trump's not doing much better either. Well, if there's one, th- if there's one thing to fault him for, and I'm, I assure you there are plenty of things, but if there's one thing specifically to fault him for, is that he has no idea when to keep his mouth shut. Wait, what? Trump. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm glad that Clinton's not in office. I wish Trump wasn't in office. I wish Bernie was, but we didn't get what we wanted, so we got to make do. Yeah, um, I became disillusioned with the whole thing the moment Bernie put his, uh, put his, uh, what, do you, what do you call it, support behind Clinton. That was yeah. like a personal betrayal. Yeah, I really wish he would have taken the Green Party's um, uh, invitation and actually ran on a third-party ticket. Yeah, he would have been better than Jill Stein, at least. Oh, God, yes. I mean, at the booth, I I wasn't going to vote for Clinton or um, uh, Trump. So pretty much when I got there, I flipped a coin between her and Gary Johnson because I knew neither one of them was going to win. Right. I ended up voting for um, uh, Jill Stein because that's what the it landed on. Right. But, I mean, it it. says a lot about the election when the person you end up choosing is is by virtue of who do you hate the least. Yeah, I know. I mean, looking back, I probably should have voted for like Gary Johnson, but he wasn't much better of a candidate either. Uh, I ended up going with Johnson, if only because I didn't have any anything better to go with. And you know, not to put too fine a point on it, but anyone who's listening to our conversation who falls on the Republican or the Democratic Party line would probably tell us that it's our fault that Trump won or or Hillary lost or whatever because we're taking votes away. But, I mean, that's not how the system is supposed to work. You're supposed to vote who you want in office in good faith, not against. Yeah, you're supposed to vote for who represents you. Exactly. And, unfortunately, none of the candidates, I, I believe, represent the interests of anybody in America, regardless of what of what the party they throw their support behind. Yeah, I mean, even with Bernie Sanders, I didn't completely agree with him on everything, but I think he represented the country the best. Well, uh, the thing about Sanders is, is like, his policies, uh, I'd hesitate to call them, like, uh, practical or, like, fiscally sound, but his reputation speaks for the fact that he actually genuinely wanted what was best for the American people. Like, he he wasn't out to gain more power. He wasn't out to make more money. His reputation was that of a civil rights leader that he made his career off of that. And keeping in mind, in Congress, every prediction he made about our foreign, about our issues with uh, foreign policy abroad has come true. So if nothing else, I think he would have been fantastic on that front Mm-hmm. He, the one thing I liked about him, and the one thing that I think made him appealing compared to pretty much every politician I've ever heard speak, is that he's consistent. He doesn't change his views from today till tomorrow. And sure, Trump is consistent, but his views are just terrible. Um, but Clinton had the opposite problem. Like she. She would change. She would say whatever she thought would be useful to her in the moment. Yeah, she that's would the biggest her problem. Position with the direction of the wind, pretty much. That combined with the large number of political scandals that had been following her since earlier, since early on in her career, she has a reputation for being a liar. You can't trust a single thing she says. And let's say best case scenario, she she won the election, right? And she didn't go for the no fly zone in Syria because the rest of the government managed to actually convince her to have enough good sense not to. Mm -hmm. 
best case scenario, her be her being out for personal gain and for and just being the kind of corrupt politician that she is, like everyone else in Congress. The best case scenario is that it would just be business as usual, and nobody wanted that. No, I sincerely think. Then again, she won the popular vote, so what do I know? Yeah, she won the popular vote by what three million? Yeah, I don't care for the electoral college in general. I think Trump's win was kind of bullshit. I mean, not that I wanted Hillary to win, but I sincerely think that there was something screwy going on there. Yeah, I agree. We need some sort of mix with the electoral college. I mean, I like what Maine and Nebraska do, and they just some uh, split it up by how the population votes. Maybe we should do that with the other states. I don't know. Yeah, well, I get the purpose of the electoral college. It's to keep um, it's to keep a check against uh, the major against the majority uh, population because the states that lean a particular way, if they have a larger population, they will win in every election. If that were the case, but that's why I think the easiest way to do it would just be one person, one vote. Don't do the whole district bullshit and do away with the call. With the electoral college entirely, that way it's it's a legitimate representation. Whoever gets elected would be a legitimate representation of what the country's population wants. But yeah, when is that but ever going to happen? That, we would need to do something like ranked choice voting. Like what voting? Uh, ranked choice, pretty much. You rank the candidates by how much you want. Like let's say, you vote Gary Johnson, then Stein, then Trump and Clinton last. And pretty much if Johnson doesn't get it, then Stein would get the vote. And if Stein didn't get enough of the majority, then the next person would get the vote. Right. The, the one thing, well, honestly, the presidency doesn't concern me that much. Like the amount, yes, they wield a lot of power, but for the most part, it's militarily. Um, and, uh, and I guess through their agencies too, but I kind of laugh at, at the concept of that, if only because, like, if uh, a large part of that is due to Bush and Obama's presidencies expanding the executive branch's abilities and nobody saying a word. So I feel like if people were to complain about it now, it'd be kind of hypocritical. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what we really need to do is limit uh, Congress's power. Like Exactly. That's what I was going to say. My bigger concern is with the legislative branch because they're the ones who actually make the laws that the executive is in charge of enforcing. But nobody pays attention to Congress because the president is a convenient figurehead. Nobody yeah. gives a shit. <laughs> yeah, I know, which is why we really need to get money out of politics and just like do a complete overhaul of our entire system. Well, that's another reason why I would not I would never have voted for Hillary. She's the one who put Citizens United on the map. Really? Yeah, she was. Um, I didn't know about that. Yeah, she was one of the big, the big proponents on the pro side for the Citizens United case that pretty much ruled um, corporations to count as individuals. They have the ability to make politically motivated donations. Yeah, I mean, I know what Citizens United is, but. There's so much stuff going on that I can't keep up with everything. Yeah, well, you have Hillary to thank for that. Yeah, true. Oh, but yeah, I mean, it's a lose, lose, lose situation. No matter what was going to happen, we were going to be in for some pretty dark days for the next four years. The only thing I hope is that we don't at least kill ourselves through nuclear fire. If we can manage that, I think we'll be. We'll be we'll be fine as far as the long term goes. Yeah, uh, I hope so. I mean, I'm still getting ready just in case because mm -hmm. I am really close to DC. Mm -hmm. No, I mean that's I'm why. Really, huh? Well, I mean that's why I, I didn't fear Trump because I mean, like, no matter what heinous shit he pulls off, we can rebuild from that. We can come back from that as long as he doesn't put us in an, in like nuclear full scale nuclear war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going to suck for a while, but we can come back from it. I mean, historically, we've proven that we can climb out of whatever dark hole we dig ourselves into. Yeah, true. I mean, I don't think he's going to be able to do much, mainly because he hasn't even completely filled up his cabinet. He hasn't filled all the positions of government that he needs, and well, nothing's happening. 
I wouldn't say nothing. He's exercised his power more so than a lot of presidents I've seen in years past. Yeah, but he's and, also uh, getting obstructed by the courts. Which is the saving grace. Supreme, yeah. the, the, the Supreme Court and the justice system is probably our biggest shield against Congress and the presidency. Mm -hmm. Ironically. And honestly, I really don't... Okay, I think he might get impeached, but that's just a political process. That doesn't mean he's being taken out of office. Exactly. A lot of people confuse impeachment with, um, with like, the pink slip. Yeah. Or whatever they call it when the president is forced to step down. Yeah, I think he will get impeached, but... I don't think he's going to be taken out of office. I honestly don't think the Russia investigation is going to go anywhere. I think a lot of his aides are going to get arrested. But I honestly think it's going to be like um, uh, the Iran-Contra back in like the 80s, where mm -hmm. the president didn't know anything. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, Trump's too stupid to be trusted with anything important, or at least he shouldn't be trusted with anything important. Yeah. So I'm not too worried on that front. There was uh, his firing of uh, FBI Director Comey a while back. That raised some eyebrows for me because I'm kind of torn on that. On the one hand, the fact that he let the, the uh, Clinton slide for everything she did mm -hmm. um, makes me think that the firing was just. But he wasn't fired for that reason. He was fired because he was investigating Trump's activities with Russia. Yeah. And actually, he wasn't even fired for that. He was fired because Trump announced that he was going to fire him. I don't even think Trump thought too too hard on that because he totally blindsided his own cabinet with it. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, Comey should have been fired anyway. His handling of everything during the election season was just grossly incompetent. Mm. I mean, I would have fired him. Mm. Yeah. What surprises me more than that, though, is uh, Trump's pardoning of, of Arpaio. Oh, God. I'm, I... Because technically, even though he does have the power to pardon, he's not supposed to be able to do that until after, until after Arpaio is convicted, one, and two, after certain investigative committees had determined that he, that there was something wrong with the conviction. Yeah. Unfortunately. I mean, we know Trump doesn't actually listen to his advisors, but still. No, he doesn't. He doesn't even listen to the rules, but. Especially since Ohio was, in fact, guilty of sin, guilty of sin of, of what he was being charged of, which was contempt of court. He deliberately violated a court order. Whether you think, whether you think he was right or not, he was definitely guilty of the crime he was charged with, so he should he should have been sentenced. That pardon should not have happened. Now, what are your thoughts on Ohio? Since I know I you're from that region, uh, I don't particularly care for him, but I also recognize that the I think the reason why I don't feel stronger about it is because I know. Um, that uh, Arpaio's actions don't directly affect me, which, yeah, that's selfish, but that's kind of the way my world is right now. And I, I know that I know that the social justice folks would uh, call it privilege. I, I fucking hate that term. But in this case, I acknowledge that there's something to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that... I don't like him. Mm -hmm. But what am I going to do about it? You know what I mean? Yeah, because I know I have a few friends that were terrified of him because they were Latino and they lived in that area. Yeah, I mean, if anything, I'd be worried about... Um, well, I guess I only really have one Latino friend and he doesn't look all that Latino, so I, he wouldn't have to worry about getting pulled over. Mm. Yeah, I have a few. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that entire situation was royally fucked up, especially what he did in those camps. Well, you might as well call them prison camps. Yeah, that's pretty much what they were. I mean, it's I, I'm surprised. Um, you, you know what? I'm kind of surprised Trump hasn't put something 
is similar in place given his stance on uh, anti-Muslim immigration. And uh, considering the thing with North Korea, I'm surprised he hasn't rounded up any South Korea, people South Korean descent. I'm yeah. not saying it's likely to happen, but considering we've done it once before. Yeah, I know, with the Japanese internment camps during World War II. Yeah. I, I'm actually surprised he didn't do that either. I mean, given uh, given the types of promises that Trump is so fond of making. Yeah. But honestly, he, he might not be that stupid, because that would be severely... I, I can't even think the words for it. Well, considering his uh, very Nazi-like attempt at uh, what, what was it during the election cycle? He was he was promising um, it was some kind of like system for keeping track keeping track of Muslims, similar to how um, the Nazis kept track of the Jews. I yeah, the like a registration system, and thank you, registration. Yeah, yeah. They... I... It wouldn't surprise me at all if he was stupid enough to... He, okay, here's the interesting thing. Do you think Trump's actions are a result of stupidity and incompetence or outright malice? Honestly, I'm not sure. I think it might be a little bit of both because he's obviously incompetent. But mm -hmm. the malice thing is a little bit harder to say because I don't know. Because I, mean, I, I personally think he's just a mouthpiece for what his supporters want to hear. So I don't think it's direct malice in the sense that he actively hates pe hates these people. But he knows his supporters do. Yeah. But at the same time, there's a story with him in the Central Park Five, I believe, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Do mm -hmm. you know that story? No. Uh, pretty much these five guys were... Um, arrested for supposedly raping this one girl. It turns out that they actually didn't. Um, uh, he put in a full-page ad during the investigation that they should be executed. Um, uh, but after they were um, uh, found not guilty, like I think like 10 years later, um, uh, he still didn't retract anything, and it was just a whole mess. Now I don't doubt that he holds nothing but contempt for uh, people in, people in the lower socioeconomic classes. Which, since some racism is involved in setting up those socioeconomic classes, I guess you could argue that he is in, that he is in fact uh, a racist as well as a xenophobe. Mm -hmm. But I think that the malice is specifically due to the fact that they belong to a different world than he does. Like. Because when I look at Trump's actions, both as a businessman and as a president, public persona in general, I kind of get the impression that this is a man who has no idea how the how the world outside of his house works. He has his his mindset has no attachment to reality whatsoever. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. So I. On on the one hand, I, I I call him an idiot, but on the other hand, I I think it's more that he just exists in a different world than everybody else, and he has no idea how to operate by the rules we expect everyone else to to uh, to adhere to. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I mean, he grew up and he got a. He says a million dollar loan when it was actually like more like ten to twenty million, and he thinks that's normal. Right. Yeah. I mean, he once compared his very short time in a military academy to actually being in the military. <sighs> I didn't even hear about that one, but then again, there's a lot of shit that I don't know because of how much stuff is going out. Well, I, I, it wasn't even a military academy. It was like one of those military high schools, you know, that you send like troubled kids to. Oh, okay. And he and he he was quoted as saying, and I'm probably paraphrasing here because I don't have it in front of me, as saying that he he was basically like being in the military. No, no. I have friends in the military who have went through like JROTC and stuff like that, and it's just like no. <laughs> Yeah, imagine somebody comparing J. Rotsi or even Rotsi to actual to B. 
being in the service. That's essentially what Trump did. It doesn't surprise me. So, yeah, I, I honestly think that his is a mindset that has no actual attachment to reality. And while I don't think that it's right, I, I do think I, I at least understand better like where his actions are coming from, mm-hmm. I guess. Because it's, like, it's almost as if they have their own moral system that is completely divorced from ours. Like, um... You ever read? You ever read like uh, old stories, like uh, like old Celtic, Celtic and German stories about like the fairy folk who have like some weird sense of morality that makes absolutely no sense to humans. Yeah, I've read a few. It's it's kind of like that, which is I don't know if that's less scary or more because that means that there is absolutely no way to control him, no matter how hard you try. And we've see, certainly seen evidence of that among uh, the people working. God, I feel bad for those poor fuckers. Yeah. Same here. <laughs> I mean... You know, there's uh, an entire team of people completely dedicated to trying to control his Twitter output. Mm-hmm. Yeah. A, a literal team. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's kind of sad when they have to make a, like, one-page memo full with graphs and charts, and they have to say his name, like, five times just so he reads the graphs and charts. Yeah, and I think he, he reads, he his entire understanding of the outside world is completely based off of what he watches on TV, and I vaguely remember reading that somewhere, I don't know how true it is. Yeah, um, I heard somewhere that <laughs> But it wouldn't surprise like- me. I've heard somewhere that he watches, like, five hours of TV, starting off with, like, MSNBC watching Morning Joe, which he claims he doesn't watch. Then he goes on the Fox and Friends and Hannity and... Yeah. Kind of makes you wonder what he does with the rest of his time. Uh, I, golf. Oh, yeah. Spending, spending almost all of his hours and wasting... Uh, American taxpayer money going to Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, well, he hasn't been going to Mar-a-Lago lately. He's been going to his New Jersey golf course lately. <laughs> I, I like to picture him as like building like bedroom forts in the Oval Office. Actually, that'd be pretty cool. I, I, like a, like a five year old. I mean, granted, I, I can't I can't say that that's a bad thing because I'd probably do the same thing in his position. But I, I, I like to picture him basically acting like a five year old. Yeah. I mean, he already does that in public anyway, so to just complete the picture. Yeah, true. I mean, with all... With him acting like a five-year-old, he's actually almost completely depleted the Secret Service budget for an entire year. Yeah. Well, that's not... In, as, as much as I would love to pin that on Trump, that's not entirely his fault. Uh, Secret Service has been losing money for decades. Yeah. I mean, I mean. Also, he has a bigger family than like Obama did, which is going to a cost for more expenses. But him taking a golf trip every weekend or going to Mar-a-Lago every weekend is not. Yeah, that's him. fucking. That's fucking inexcusable. It's it's, yeah. it's irresponsible on like I don't know how many levels. All of them. It's irresponsible on all the levels. Yeah. I mean, even with Melania up in um, uh, New York with Barron, I mean, I understand that you want to keep your child in the same school, but that's costing, I think, a million dollars a day at minimum. What? Well, what school are they sending him to? Uh, some high-priced school in New York. I don't know the name of it. No, I'll, have to, I'll have to look that up later. Because, like, I, for some reason, even in New York, which I know, like, in, in very large cities, mm-hmm. like, living, living, the price of living and stuff is, like, you have to be richer than God, basically, just to afford a crappy apartment. But for some reason, I have trouble believing that even a private school would cost a million dollars a day to attend. Oh, no, 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 the security is a million dollars a day. Oh, okay, see, that makes more sense. All right, yeah. I, I was confused. I think his school is maybe like 70000 a year. 
maybe. Probably more. Um, granted, I've never been to a rich private school, but uh, that still kind of stretches my suspension of disbelief, but that is at least more believable. <laughs> well, I was actually in the private school system here in Maryland. Um, uh, I went to a, a private Catholic school. Mm-hmm. And I actually used to travel to actually the um, uh, really high-end schools like Gilman and McDonough. I know you don't know what they are, but they're really up there schools that cost like at least twenty to thirty thousand dollars a year to go to. In fact, McDonough actually has their um, uh, um, like dorms, and it's just like a a K through twelve school. Hmm. Yeah, the kids actually sleep there. Oh shit. So it's like one of those uh, old-fashioned boarding schools. Yeah, essentially it is, but for rich kids. Okay, that that makes sense. If you had said fifty grand, that wouldn't have. I I would have believed that. Well, yeah, that's pretty much the cost of those schools down here in New York. They're probably like double, triple, maybe even quadruple that. Damn. Yeah. I've never been to New York, so I could. I, I have. I'm just going to take your word for it. <laughs> well, I've never been in New York either, but I really have no desire to go up there. Fair enough. Yeah. I mean, I, mean, I, I like visit, I like visiting California. It's really pretty, but I wouldn't want to live there. Yeah, I couldn't live in, like, L.A., maybe in, like, um, uh, Northern California, like uh, Eureka or somewhere like that, but L.A., well, I don't know. Well, I don't know. I mean, I mean I'd be willing... I'd be willing to move to California for like a big city like LA if there was a really good job attached to it. Um, I know SpaceX has their headquarters. Um, their factory, at least, is in LA. Oh, yeah. Speaking of SpaceX, um, what about this Arizona Hyperloop that I've been hearing about? Can you tell me a little bit about that? Uh, sure. Well, I mean, it's not specifically just Arizona. That's just the team that was in the competition that uh, I was a part of. But the actual competition is run by SpaceX, and um, it's, it's based off of this hyper this uh, hyperloop concept that Elon Musk came up with a while back. I'm sure his paper is floating around somewhere. Um, and, and essentially, what the concept is is it's a pod being run through a vacuum chamber. The, the pod is like one car of a bullet train, if you can kind of picture that. Okay being pushed up to ridiculously high speeds. In fact, about the speed of a bullet train. Damn. It's, uh, and, uh, it would be cheap. It would be cheap enough that you could use it for commuting. So cheaper than airfare, faster and more environmentally friendly than driving. Um, I believe that, I believe what was, what I vaguely remember being quoted is, uh, if one were to be built from, uh, L.A. to San Francisco to Las Vegas. That, the, that was what uh, Musk was proposing at the time. That you would be able to get from L.A. to San Francisco in about 30 minutes. Holy shit. And LA, the distance from L.A. to San Francisco is, I think, roughly equivalent either from Phoenix to Flagstaff or from Tucson to Flagstaff. So that gives you an idea as to how much you would be able to travel in Arizona if one were built here. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I know how long it takes from the drive from L.A. to San Francisco, because I've done it. It, mm-hmm. it takes a while. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I don't know any anything about the first competition, because I wasn't there for that. But uh, I was there for three months of the second competition. All the design work had been done, so I, I was basically helping with assembly and documentation at that point. Uh, I can't get into the details of what specifically we built um, for a couple of reasons. One, because... It would. I don't know who listens to this, and I don't want to uh, well, affect their chances in the next competition. And secondly, because uh, the, the leadership of the team was talking about making like an actual startup business, so they could actually get the damn thing built in Arizona. So who knows? In a couple of years, the, the our systems might end up being proprietary. <laughs> oh damn! That's that's pretty cool. Uh, but we made but we made a functioning a functioning pod. Um, the the only requirements for the competition was that it had to be the fa- it had to be the fastest and it had to not crash, preferably get to the end of the uh, of the track that SpaceX had set up, and and it was cool. 
when I when I got to the competition, it was kind of like a, a SpaceX Tesla convention because there were some parts of it that were open to the public, and I think since the since that was open to news media and we could take pictures and stuff, I, I think that I'm allowed to talk about because um, they were showing stuff like uh, parts of parts of the rocket that they had built, um, the the new model Model X and Model Three Teslas. Ooh. Actually got actually got to sit in the Model X. It, it was pretty cool. Man, how was that? <laughs> the chairs were not as comfortable as they looked from the outside, but the inside was pretty interesting. The windshield was huge, and uh, they have like this very large electronic interface, um, like built into the dash between the wheel, between the driver's side and the passenger side. Mm-hmm. It could it, it had like the rear the rear view camera G. PS, uh, Pandora, and YouTube of all things. That I don't know. It seemed like it would be kind of distracting for use in a vehicle. But then again, Musk was also talking about like self-driving AI. So maybe in a couple of years, that won't that won't matter. <laughs> Honestly, right now, self-driving AI scares the fuck out of me. After seeing uh, Fast and Furious Eight, and every car got hacked. <laughs> That's a good point. But for some reason, I don't picture that being that big of a deal. Um, what I do know is that SpaceX actually has no plans of, build, of building the Hyperloop. That's why the competition is open source. It's we had There were a ton of teams, both national and international. Um, I think the team that won was... Don't quote me on this, because I don't remember off the top of my head, but I want to say it was the one from Switzerland. Switzerland. Okay. Um, maybe it was the one from from uh, the from uh, the Munich the Munich Institute of Technology or whatever it was, I mean obviously you can't trust my word on that because I don't remember. Well, it, it would make sense that um uh, Switzerland or Germany would win just because they're really good with engineering. Yeah, we had a we had the Arizona team, which is composed of AS, uh, students from ASU and NAU, and I think Ember Riddle um, donated these to their labs. I don't know if they had any students on the team proper. Um. There was a team from Seattle, I vaguely recall. There was probably a team from MIT. I'm not actually sure. Um, I, I know there was Swiss Loop, which is a team based in Switzerland. There was a team, I think, from New Zealand. A team from India, a team from Germany, and a few others that I don't really recall. Hmm. But yeah, it was a lot of fun, and I'm glad that, I'm glad that I went. Um I, I, unfortunately, I won't be able to participate in this upcoming third competition because I'm still at university. I have my uh, my, my capstone that I'll be working on pretty soon. I just got assigned to a team, um, and I also have a job now. But I'm going to try and see if I can't help um, another AZ Loop member recruit some students out of our university. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, yeah. I mean, do you, are you going to try and go after that after you graduate or what? Well, well, I mean, the, the requirement for the second competition, and I don't know if that'll be for, for future competitions, but for the second competition, there were no alumni involved. Um, one of the requirements was that it had to be a completely student-run team composed entirely of students. So the faculty themselves, um, beyond like donations or whatever, weren't actually part of the team. So they couldn't like advise or anything. I'm not sure they could look. I mean, they had a significant investment just putting us on like news media and whatever and, and whatever. In fact, the Discovery Channel in Canada came to take a look. ABC, um, the the local news media as well. Uh, we've had people from all over talk about it, um, and we had a shit ton of sponsors. Wow. Um, which I, I'm probably allowed. To talk about the fact that we had sponsors, I mean, the whole point is is to get people to buy their stuff. Uh, I know Fusion sponsored us, uh, Fusion Three Hundred and Sixty. Oh, it was wow. like the auto the Autodesk CAD program. Okay. Um. um unfortunately, I can't really remember the other sponsors off the top of my head. Um. I kind of feel bad. Because I I want to give them a shout out over the over this in case there are any engineers listening. 
Well, I'm sure they're happy just to be t- getting talked about, you know. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, it was exciting, and um, I didn't get to tour the actual factory facility. That was just for the advanced team. But I did get like they had they had a booth that had these Oculus Rifts that had like um, a video recorded tour of the inside of the factory. And that was pretty cool. Oh. And I asked them about it, and apparently um, there are lots of folks who used to work on the on the Hyperloop. The first Hyperloop competition, they got jobs in SpaceX out of college, so um, SpaceX or Tesla or whatever. And I found out that there's a, that SpaceX is a factory mm-hmm. in in Hawthorne, California, which is like it's 10 minutes from LAX, so it's kind of part of LA. Um, and that's right next to their Tesla design facility, which I didn't get to see the inside of, but I saw the lobby. It's very slick. <laughs> it's like. Um, it, it looked like they took an old aircraft hangar and repurposed that for their design facility. Um, I know SpaceX built satellites in Seattle, mm-hmm. and they have uh, a testing facility out in Texas, and in Fort Lauderdale, obviously, is where they launched the rockets. So there's options. Um, if, uh, if if working for SpaceX is your dream, there you go. Now you Now you know what locations to apply at. Oh, yeah. uh, apparently it's that simple too because when I asked the SpaceX rep there she said yeah just apply if we want to hire you we'll hire you wow if only more places were like that right it, it didn't involve like some 20,000 step process in order to even get an interview mm-hmm. if it was just as simple as apply get an interview and maybe they'll hire yeah, I mean, I just went through an entire application process, and honestly, there was like 50,000 different steps just to get a freaking, um, uh, to the application stock shelves. Jesus. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's probably more to it than that. I haven't seen the application forms that SpaceX has, but I mean, she made it sound really simple, so well, uh, I might that, take a look at that when I graduate. Uh, who knows? Well, Knowing Elon and how he wants to streamline everything, I would believe it's simple. It would be nice. I mean, he's basically like the real life Tony Stark. Oh God, yeah. Now, did you actually see him when you were there? Unfortunately, no. I had to leave early so I could get back to Phoenix and have enough time to sleep, and then pack all my shit so I could move back to Flagstaff to go back to school. Oh, damn. Because that would have been cool. It would have. I, I did see. A uh, video of him giving his speech, congratulating, um, congratulating the winning team, and that was pretty. That was pretty cool. Oh wow. Um. Yeah. <laughs> oh. But uh, there's some serious competition involved. So, uh, any, any of you listeners out there, if you're an engineering student and you're interested in doing this, uh, there's a lot more. <laughs> There's a lot more of us than a ton of pods um, that go into it. And you might make it the competition and not even run because they only have so many time slots. But it's a good it's a good it's a good networking opportunity. I definitely recommend being a part of the competition. They ha- I know they have at least two set up for the next couple of years. So yeah, if you're listening and you're an engineering student, get on and get your school involved. I promise promise you, your faculty will probably be really interested to hear about it. Yeah. I mean, we need more engineers out there. We need more scientists. We need a lot more of everything right now. Yeah. Yeah, I, I once got into a tiff with someone over Facebook because we shared a post talking about... Um, uh, they, they were talking They were talking about, like, jobs that were available for... that were, weren't available, rather for the, I guess you could say, socially disadvantaged. But one of the reasons they gave for solar power not being a thing was because it was, quote-unquote, vaguely effeminate. And I'm like, well, I agree with your sentiments. I don't think you should talk at all about engineering subjects because you clearly have no idea what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So solar power hasn't been rejected because it's vaguely effeminate. It's been rejected because we still haven't developed a solution that is as efficient as our other as our other energy models. And besides, even if we did develop such a system, it would only be useful in certain geographical regions because of the amount of sun they get. There's a lot of limitations involved uh, on the technology. and But you'll never 
never hear people talking. You'll never hear engineers talking about that on the news because, God forbid, we actually bring in experts to talk about the subject before letting the public come to an informed opinion. Yeah, or at least letting them talk for more than a four-second soundbite. God, yeah. My my favorite thing to happen in the past year or so was hearing that Bill O'Reilly got fired. <laughs> oh, God, that was glorious. I... I my my esteem for the institution of journalism has risen sl- slightly since then. Uh, yeah, slightly. <laughs> because they're all just missing the mark on all cylinders, you know. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't know enough about the about journalism to comment, but I would say that there was a time when being a part of a newspaper meant something. Yeah, I mean, now it's just about how many views you get, and everything's clickbait. And it's... Well, a number of views isn't so much the problem, because, I mean, newspapers are being killed by uh, by, by blogs, and that was going to happen whether we wanted it to or not. The, 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 the problem lies in a lack of ethics, specifically a lack of fact-checking. Yeah. Um, well, with considering that we live in an era where the most powerful, like the most powerful um, repository of knowledge is available to us in under like a second, mm-hmm. there, there's no excuse for that. Yeah, there really is no excuse for not fact checking everything you hear. Yeah, yeah. although I. I, th- I think uh, relatives on social media would be it would be good for them to hear that message as well, not just the actual people in charge of sending news out. Oh God, yes. Ugh. I mean, I have deleted so many people off my Facebook just because I got tired of hearing what they're saying, and talking to them is like no use. Yeah, I've had a couple of people that I just don't talk to anymore. Not because they disagree with me. I can handle that. My my problem was more that they were just dicks about it. Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I have a few people on Facebook that I disagree with on a lot of things, but they will actually listen to my point and I will listen to theirs, so we can still have a good conversation. Right. But there's a lot of people on there that is just like hardline, which is a real problem right now with the polarization. Well, it's not even the hardline polarization that bugs me. What bugs me is when they take that uh, that higher than thou attitude. Yeah. Where they're just, well, they'll, where they'll just sarcastically dismiss everything you say. They won't actually, they won't actually even bother to take the time to attack your point. They'll just uh, immediately. Oh, say what do they call it? They'll, they'll immediately say you're wrong, or they'll do uh, what do they call it? Uh, if it's not an ad hominem attack, it's a, it's setting you up for a straw man. You know, making you making your point, making a setting up a fallacious version of your point to make it easier to uh, to attack and defeat because you're not actually attacking the person's argument; you're attacking the version of their argument that you created in your head or out loud. Yeah, that that's a big problem today. I don't, know. I, I don't even talk politics on social media anymore because I just can't stand it. Um, yeah. it I, think, I think speech and debate should be taught in all high schools because if nothing else, they could at least teach you, like, um, not manners. What's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, How to have a conversation. The etiquette. The etiquette of oh, debate. Yeah. I can Because, like, because, like, um, there's a certain way to do that that's not going to put off potential allies and people who agree who might agree with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, granted, you still have to know the difference between people who just haven't been swayed yet and people who aren't going to agree with you no matter what. But I mean, the latter is obviously not going to be worth your time. But yeah. you can't you can't assume that that applies to everyone. Mm-hmm. you talk to yeah. like some people can actually be convinced to change their mind it's strange to hear i know but 
yeah, I mean, what we really need to do, along with adding speech and debate for, like, high schools and stuff, is, like, change the entire educational system from the ground up. Because, I mean, I would love for um, uh, education to be free on the college level, but what's the point in having free college education when kids can't even get into college or they drop out within two months? Well... I, I think we should also put a lot more focus on trade schools, too, because oftentimes it's not even brought up as an option by uh, high school counselors, which is fucking insane to me. Um, because the, the narrative that's often given to, given to people is you either go to college and get, it, and get a good job, or you don't, and you end up like in mediocrity forever or dying poor. Yeah. Those I mean, are not your only two options. <laughs> It, yeah, I know. That, that narrative is a lie. <laughs> I agree. I mean, especially with a lot of the trades going, actually, they're retiring within the next, like, five to ten years. We mm-hmm. need plumbers. We need electricians. We need people in these trades because houses still need to get built or fixed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. And I mean, those are the, just the two obvious ones to think of. But there's also like, um, like the sort of things that you'd see back on back on Dirty Jobs, back when Mike Rose still did, you know, was acting. Where you'd see like sewage workers or, or shit like that, like the, the shit nobody else wants to do. That pays good money, specifically because nobody else wants to do them. Yeah, I know. So, Sometimes it's not a lack of opportunities, it's just a lack of imagination. Yeah, I mean... And it's... I, but I don't blame, I don't blame the people who are disadvantaged for that. I blame the people who are supposed to tell them what their opportunities are. Yeah. I, um, I mean, because like I said, they, they don't even bring up trade schools as an option in most high schools. Mm-hmm. Like, What? That, that's an entire path that you're denying these kids. Oh, God. It's not yeah. right. I mean, they need to bring back shop. They need to bring back home ec. I mean, mm-hmm. you need kids need these basic skills to survive in the real world. I mean, I know nobody's going to use a check anymore, or at least soon they're going to be obs- completely obsolete. But I didn't even learn how to use a check until I... Um, I was in 18, 19. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, kids don't know how to fend for themselves. And, and that's that's not the kids' fault, because I know the, the conservative rhetoric is often to, like, blame the, disadvantage, the disadvantaged for the disadvantages they have, which, obviously, that's not true, and it's fucked up on its own merits. Mm-hmm. Um... It, that's where I think the argument for like uh, sy- for systemic not race not r- racism exactly although that's kind of tied to class to uh, the class the socioeconomic class disadvantages but classism specifically mm-hmm. that's where I think the argument for for institutionalized and systemic classism like really makes sense. Because these kids don't know any better. They need somebody to tell them what opportunity they have so they know that there's opportunities that they can even grab. I mean, they, the, the conservative rhetoric is often like equal opportunity does not equal equality. It's not the same as equality of outcome. And I'm like, well, that, that may be true. Mm-hmm. But what are you supposed to do when the people who know what the opportunities are won't tell you how to get them yeah. or where to find them or where, where do you? even get started just looking even if they're not gonna they don't have to hand it to you but at least give you a resource that you can make use of something yeah i mean just looking at my education through um, my high school and my brother's education it's night and day i mean granted i did go to a private high school so i did have a little bit more advantages than my brother's but they taught me how to find scholarships. They taught me how to find everything that I needed to survive in college. Granted, I didn't take advantage of them until I was older. 
but my brother doesn't even know what half these things are t- I'm talking about are. They didn't teach him anything about that stuff. And that's just lack of teaching. Like, uh, that's that's the best case scenario. The worst case scenario, sometimes these high schools will straight up lie to you. I mean, there was the false narrative I mentioned, but there's also the fact that, like, okay, for high school, I went to a charter school, all right? Mm-hmm. So that, that might open up a can of worms right there. Uh, I went to a charter school that billed itself as a college preparatory school. <laughs> and I will say I did have some advantages in that I was in the nice, not one of the nicer parts of town. There wasn't, a, there wasn't really much of a criminal element with the school. Um, but our principal got away with all kinds of shit that he shouldn't have. In fact, I was told that if we weren't a charter school, he would have lost his job. <laughs> oh, wow. For some of the shit he did. I mean, and, uh, uh, I mean that that could be a whole episode in and of itself. But um, the, the Cliff Notes version, the one thing he did directly, the one thing he was guilty of in terms of uh, that he did directly to me, I could I could speak about the other rumors, but I won't um, right now. Um, one time when we were on a senior trip, uh, and someone who had previously been expelled from our school happened to meet up with some of the students that I was rooming with at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I still don't know what it was he was trying to accuse me of, but he basically said that, like, something about the, the expelled student and them, if, uh, in North, oh, I, I probably shouldn't name the school, if, um, if the school finds out about it, they won't believe, and I didn't say anything, they won't believe that I didn't know, and he said, and I quote, we will go after your scholarship. God damn. Um, and also that you, I, I don't think he threatened that I wouldn't graduate, but he did threaten to go after my scholarship, but I don't think he had the power to do in the first place. Uh, but that's really fucking ballsy. <laughs> yeah. My God. Um, and I didn't even know how to take that, so I didn't react react to it the way I wish I had, which would have been basically to point out to him that I am more than aware of numerous skeletons in his closet, and uh, if he ever tried shit like that again, I, I'd probably have enough if I could convince the people involved to put together a lawsuit. Damn. <laughs> well. And, and, that, and that's just that, but, but in terms of straight-up lying to, lying to people... The whole point of me bringing up the school was uh, the fact that they built themselves as a college preparatory school. By the time I finally got into university, um, like four years ago, I had no idea what the fuck I was doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm, I've essentially been writing out a track that was suggested to me, and I'm glad. And I'm glad it was because I didn't start out liking engineering. It wasn't what I would have picked at that point in my life as a first choice, but I'm glad I did it because I found out years later that I do enjoy it. And it's probably going to put me in a better position than if I had picked something else. Mm. But in terms of actual guidance, in terms of what to do, both leading up to and during my university, if it, before meeting my university advisors, i had no idea what I was doing. Um, the the uh, structure classes, any of that. Um, putting together funding for schooling, although I have some advantage in that respect as well. I had very little in the way of guidance, and I honestly feel like I think my uh, the high school I went to bears some of the fault for that. Well, yeah, because because like I said, you can't call your okay. You can't when you're selling yourself to prospective students to come to your institution, which isn't it's kind of a public institution, but not really because it's a charter school. Mm-hmm. You can't just falsely advertise to them. You can't just tell them that you're a college preparatory school and then do nothing to fulfill that obligation. Because once you sell yourself on that. You have an obligation to follow through as soon as they start giving you money. Yeah, y- you do. I mean, I was lucky in that respect because the private Catholic school that I went to 
was also a college prep school, but they at least helped us out a little bit. I still wasn't prepared because that was just, but that was just my own immaturity. I wasn't ready for college when I was 18. And honestly, most 18 year olds aren't. Well, I mean, that's preaching to the choir. I wasn't re- I don't know if I would have been ready whether I got the proper guidance or not, but I do feel like I didn't get I didn't get any kind of guidance really. Um, but yeah, I was 18, so I, I was young and stupid. I admit that. Yeah. I mean, I've done a lot of shit when I was 18. Now, one thing that I think uh, should happen is we have like what other countries do with um, mandatory service. Now, I'm not talking about just with the military. You could be, like, two years of service with, like, the military or the Peace Corps or maybe, like, diplomatic services. I think that would be beneficial to the entire country because not only do you get, like, work experience, but you also get life experience. You get to know how shitty it can be in other countries. Yeah. Yeah. See, yeah, see, when you said, uh, if you had, if you had said specifically military service, I might've raised an eyebrow only because like I used, I used to be a proponent of the idea of mandatory military service in exchange for citizenship, but then I came of age and didn't serve. Mm -hmm. So clearly my opinion has changed a little bit on that, but I, I would agree um, mandatory public service, yeah, in some in some fashion. Yeah, I mean it would help everybody. Cause, hate to say it, I met. This is not everybody from California, but when I was in Arizona, and whenever I talk to somebody from California, they don't know how the rest of the world um uh, works. I mean. When the shooting happened back in, like, 2015, when somebody got shot on campus, and this is at NAU, uh, Northern Arizona University, for those who are listening. Um, oh, yeah, I remember that. People were, my, my relatives were calling me, asking me if I was all right, which I had no idea what was going on because I only got the phone calls and texts, like, after I woke up, because this happened, like, really early in the morning. Yeah, it happened, like, 3 a.m. in the morning for us. <laughs> My parents in Baltimore knew before I did because they were calling me, waking me up, asking yeah, me that if I was, was all right. But, yeah, that was uh, really weird. One of the people who called me was my grandfather in Tennessee. Yeah. Well, they're also three hours ahead of us uh, time-wise. So, Tennessee's two hours ahead, so yeah. Oh, yeah, they're still ahead. <laughs> yeah, so, so it's, it's weird, right? Yeah, but... Um, the next day, I was actually interviewed by the school newspaper, and my response actually scared them a little bit, because I'm from Baltimore. People get shot every day. People die every day. In fact, we're on the verge of um, uh, having one murder per day uh, for this year. It, it, it's scary here. <laughs> so... Somebody getting shot honestly doesn't phase me. And that threw them for a loop because the person who interviewed me was from, like, California, and she's not used to that type of stuff. Now, if you're from, like, Oakland, you get a little bit more of a real sense of how things are. But this person was from, uh, I believe, L.A., and they really didn't know what violence was. Wait, you said they're from L.A., but they're not familiar with well, the concept of Well, they were from the, the, um, uh, like the good areas of L.A., okay? Oh, uh, okay. Okay, yeah. that's fair. Yeah. I mean, I hear someone gets shot on the news, like, every day. Someone gets stabbed. I'm desensitized to violence, pretty much. Now, it's sad that the guy died, but life goes on. Well, uh, what got me was that they kept calling it uh, in the news like a, a campus shooting, like a school shooting, which when you say that phrase, you're bringing to mind something very specific, which wasn't what happened. 
Yeah, you think like um, Virginia Tech or Columbine. Columbine, yeah. yeah. But uh, so uh, that kind of annoyed me a little bit because I'm very the the one conservative thing I happen to, I happen to agree with is I'm very pro Second Amendment. Oh, same here. And uh, not pro gun control, not because I have a problem with gun control itself, but because it's been proven not to work. Well, uh, at least not, at least not how we've been use, utilizing it so far. I, I'm for limited gun control because who needs a um a freaking AK-47 to go hunting or something like that? Fair point, uh, I, and I don't disagree with you there. I'm just saying that the methods we've used to utilize. We've, we've, the methods we've used to put gun control in place have so far not worked very well. At least not at least not in the cities where it's supposed to work. Chicago, for instance. Oh, yeah. Um, but what I was going to say was... Um, but it, it bugged me because it wasn't what actually happened. For those of you listening who um, didn't hear about the death on our on campus basically from what i understand from reading about it after the fact what happened was this party or some shit like that and he got into an altercation with these two frat dudes he ran to his he ran to his truck shouted that he had a, had a gun got his gun out of the car and then shot both of them and one of those two students died so he was a coward basically because he had the opportunity and ability to run away and he didn't use it yeah, and I'm. I think the guy's in jail now, so, which is a good thing. I'm pretty. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, like he got sentenced. If he didn't get sentenced to life, I would be surprised. But yeah. at the very least, he probably got sentenced to ten to twenty years. Yeah, I mean, and that's what you get. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Shit. What was especially funny was the days afterward, the the quotes of what he said at trial trying to make him seem like the victim defending mm-hmm. himself, which even by how he described the situation was clearly not the case. Yeah. It used to be if you got a tip with somebody, you'd beat the shit out of each other and then you'd be fine afterwards because you've resolved the problem. But now, God, don't even get me started on like elementary schools that and high schools that expel you for getting in fights off campus, not even related to school. Yeah. <sighs> my, high, my high school did that. Yeah, I mean, like, I've worked in the school system. It, yeah, it's stupid. They're going way too far. It's like people can't be trusted to resolve their their own problems amongst themselves anymore. Yeah, and as a result, you're raising an entire generation of people who can't defend themselves when they need to, because they have no idea how. I mean, I'm against violence, but if two kids are having a scrap, yeah. Break it up, give them both attention, tell them to work it out uh, by talking, and then go about your day. You know, that's all I, you I, need to do. Right. I, I'm not saying I'm pro vi- pro violence either. I don't don't get. Well, I never say you were. People. Well, I know, but people are listening to this. Yeah. They they don't know who I am. Um. I, I, I'm not saying I'm I'm pro violence. I, I'm just saying that there is a time and a place when defending yourself is necessary. Mm-hmm. I feel I feel that you should be should, you should be able to or at least know how to do that. And I'm not even necessarily talking about firearms here either. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If, if if you're looking for non-lethal means, buy yourself a taser or like a club or some shit. Yeah, I mean, learn way. learn some kind of martial training. Go go to the gym, learn some boxing or something, or hell, get really good at running away. Yeah, something. Honestly, I think um, some form of martial arts should be taught in schools, whether it's jujitsu or something like that, because that teaches you discipline. It teaches you how easy it is to hurt somebody, and you're less likely to get into a fight if you're trained in martial arts. I also think you'd probably be less predisposed towards violence because when you learn how easy it is to hurt someone, you're less likely to want to do that, at least if you're, you know, a normal human being with empathy. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I started training in martial arts back when I was 20, I had some severe anger issues. 
and mm. that got beat out of me real quick. And now it's like, I'm going to try and talk my way out of any situation I'm in. And if I get into a fight, I get into a fight, but I will not be the one who starts it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, see, outside of outside of sparring matches, I've never been in a real fight. I've never, I, I've never been the strong kid growing up. So I had to get really good at talking my way out of shit. Mm-hmm. So that that's that's what I'm good at. I'm I'm not a fighter. I'll admit that right now. I'm probably the last thing one would expect to be like a really strong dude. But I can defuse a situation pretty well, and usually, the, and usually that'll be enough. Um, See, unfortunately, with me being a big guy, and I've always been a big guy, I've had people mm-hmm. like come after me. Unfortunately, mm-hmm. so I've been in a few fights, and they've ended fairly quickly for the other person. Mm-hmm. But I don't like fighting. I mean, it's just like I've gotten to the point where I now can defuse a situation pretty quickly, but unfortunately, I think you have to be some kind of sociopath or to actually enjoy violence. Yeah, like well, beyond the superficial level that you experience in movies and games. Yeah. Now, when I'm in the fight, I actually enjoy the adrenaline rush, but afterwards, I feel terrible. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, like. Like, like I said, if you're a normal human being who possesses empathy, you're not going to get any kind of enjoyment out of inflicting pain. Like, who does that? Nobody. Anyway, and, and I'm not, I'm not talking about S and M for people who are for any listeners who might be into that. I'm just saying. Yeah. Well, S and M's a completely separate podcast, which I don't oh, think you want to get yeah. into with me. Probably not. I'm just pointing out that I recognize the difference. Yeah. I mean... Yeah. I mean, you have to be a complete um, sociopath to enjoy violence like that. Would it be a sociopath or a psychopath? I don't know if there's even any difference anymore, because they're not even technically mental health terms. They're, I think, legal definitions. Kind of like insanity. I don't know. Um... I have a mental health professor coming on within the next couple weeks. I'll ask her then. But I, I'm not too sure of the definitions of myself. Yeah, well, they're really easy to confuse, too, because the popular media just uses them interchangeably. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think psychopaths so are more help. prone to violence, I, I, but I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, I, I honestly don't remember. I remember doing some reading because I thought it was kind of interesting, but I forgot pretty much all of it because I only have so much hard drive space in my head here. Yeah, I agree. (laughs) Oh, damn. Yeah, uh, things are fucked up in this world. (laughs) Uh Yeah. Oh, well, um, we actually just did about a good hour. I'm, uh, I think this is a good place to stop for now. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Um, I well, uh, thanks thank for having me on your show. No problem. I'd love to have you on again because I know there's a lot of stuff that we have talked about and that would be interesting to other people that we could talk about again. Yeah, all right. All right. It won't be another politics episode, will it? <laughs> it's just how things are going on right now. Um, yeah. Hey, next time we can talk about the stuff you're writing if you want. Sure, all right. All right. Why not? All right. Well, it was good talking to you. Um, thanks for coming on. All right. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Make sure you subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to, uh, whether it be iTunes, Google Play, Podbean. I'm not going to be posting on SoundCloud for a little while, mainly because I have reached the limit of uh, what I can post on there in terms of gigabyte-wise. So once I get a little bit more money and I can put more money into the podcast, I will start posting more stuff on SoundCloud. So this will be the last episode that I post up onto SoundCloud for a good while. Um, Yeah, uh, if you want to get in contact with me, I am on Twitter and Facebook at Roaming Viking. And I am on Instagram at The Roaming Viking. Make sure you put T-H-E in front of Roaming Viking. Thank you. Until next time.